Tony Nils. Hi. <laughs> Last round. The standard evolutionary theory today is the evolutionary synthesis. It was built in the 1930s and based on Darwin's and Mandel's work, but also based on population genetics. The question today is, is this model still sufficient to explain what happens in evolution? Today I'm going to present you an empirical study. The material contains some thrilling, hopefully thrilling aspects of spontaneous, complex, biased variation, which were partly known in earlier times, also by Darwin, but which didn't fit into the standard theory well. Thus, variations like these were more or less ignored in the evolutionary theory. Let's see how the new discipline of evolutionary developmental biology, or EVO-DEVO, can integrate the new insights. Having studied, having studied evolutionary theory with textbooks, you should agree in four points with me. First, random mutation plays a major role in evolution. Second, organisms are completely genetically determined. Third, evolution proceeds long acting in innumerable gradual steps. Fourth, evolution is ex an external concept. Externalistic means that natural selection is the dominating factor. Selection is external to the phenotype. It's not inside the phenotype. That's why the evolutionary theory is often called the theory of selection. If I'd, let, if I'd say, let's critically think about these four points, you might think of me as a heretic, would you? In the classical model, Random mutation and selective processes alternate again and again. That's the concept. Only after a very long time and after innumerable steps, a phenotypic trait like a horn of a rhino or a trunk of an elephant or you on my nose or you on my fingers are formed as we see them today. Now let's extend our view a bit. Darwin is dead for more than 100 years. We are talking about black holes in astrophysics. We might land on the Mars in the next coming decade. We are talking on cognition without cortex. Um, so please, let's also see which new perspectives have influenced evolutionary theory in the last years or decades. In the media, these perspectives are often overseen. There is two fields being ignored in evolutionary synthesis. First, embryonic development, and second, environment. These fields together play an interactive game with evolution. Or you'd better say evolution is the interplay of all three fields here. This makes evolution a much more complex scenario than it was in the old Darwinian world. Now I'm going to show you what I mean with some examples. Embryonic development. Each phenotype variation is built within an embryo. Thus, it's essential to study how the process of phenotypic change works. You cannot understand phylogenetic change without understanding ontogenetic change. No way. The discipline of evolutionary development biology, or EVO-DEVO, is concerned here. Understanding embryonic development can help us to obtain a better understanding of evolution. That's strange, huh? This man shows polydactyly. He has more than five digits at one or best case at each extremity. And even better for him if it's all symmetric. I promise to you, this picture is not manipulated by Photoshop. This variation is built within one generation. It doesn't need a hundred thousand years or a million years 
to come up. Instead, fingers or toes are built within two or three days in, early embryonic, in an early embryonic stage of a chick, a mouse, or a human baby. The only remaining question is, which ones are the superfluous fingers on, on the picture? I'll leave it open for the moment. One thing must be clear. A genetic mutation, a point mutation, and this man carries a mutation, cannot explain this trait sufficiently. Let's see how polydactylous toes are built at a cat. This is a picture of a cat. The picture here shows a right forelimb of a Maine Coon cat, like this. Thumb on the th below and the fifth finger on the upper side. You see two extra digits on the thumb side, which is called the preaxial side. That's why we talk about preaxial polydactyly. You see a complete, very thin extra digits on the outer side. This is the right red arrow. You also see a part of a new digit which is not connected to the main skeleton, seen by the left red arrow, and we name this element a free-floating element. It is connected only via blood vessels, muscles and skins. The only genetic variation at this kind of polydactyly is a single point mutation. It's a point mutation in a cis-regulatory element of the sonic hedgehog gene. Almost 1,000 base pairs apart from the gene itself. The cis element lies in the middle of another gene. That's real strange. A cis-regulatory element means it is a mutation in a non-coding element. The result are fingers, new fingers. Thus, we can say without the mutation we have five digits. With the mutation, we get six digits, right? Right? No, not right. With the mentioned mutation, we get either 18 toes in total at the cat, or 20, or 22, 24, up to 26 toes in total. Or we get odd numbers of toes like 21, or 23, or 25 toes. But let's do slowly. The only fact so far is the genetic variation cannot tell us the whole story of an one or more extra toes. A mutated gene like Sonic Hedgehog cannot build a toe. On the picture, you get an impression of how complex a toe is with all its elements of bones, muscles, nerves, blood vessels, and so on. 10 million cells or more. What I did is, I counted the toes of 371 cats <laughs> in the internet. I found a database in the internet, an American database, and I counted toes for three months or so. Three, 371 mutants. And you might believe it or not, the result looked like this. I got a discrete statistical distribution of the number of toes. 18 times. Cats with 18 toes, toes, sorry. 141 times cats with 20 toes, and so on. 108 times, 22 toes, and so on. More toes were less often. The maximum was 26 toes, in total per individual. This all is a result of a simple identical point mutation. Would you say this is a Mendelian inheritance? No, it isn't, never ever. What if we make a little calculation? Let's subtract the number of the hindfoot toes from the number of the forefoot toes, another, another three months. Then we get this picture, <laughs> a statistical distribution again. Both forms of variation are named polyphonism. A polyphonism is a variable phenotypic form resulting out of a single point mutation. It's even more here. It's a biased variation. The bias is the maximum of the distribution in both pictures. That means development 
governs a bias. Bias is a taboo word in evolution and in evolutionary theory. According to Ernst Meyer and Julian Huxley, there is no bias in evolution at all. But there are biases here. Okay, so far we are not talking on evolution yet. Till here we are talking on development, embryonic development. At the University of Vienna, Department of Theoretical Biology, we try to bring these facts into an Evo Devo model. The model is named the Hemingway model. Why this? Because mutant cats are of a population of Ernest Hemingway in Key West, Florida. He got a polydactylous cat as a present from a captain in the 1930s. When I visited Hemingway's house in 1991, there were about 60, 65 polydactylous cats there. I did some nice pictures and that was all I was interested in at that time. You see, you see three headlines on the slide playing a role in the Hemingway model. Above, the discontinuous distribution of the phenotype. In the middle line, a continuous distribution of individual cellular effects and below, small individual cellular and genetic effects. Let's have a closer look on these three things. It's, this is the most complex slide, but it's the only one, I hope. The Hemingway model explains the scenery between the molecular cellular level below and the phenotypic toe level above. On the molecular and cellular level, first there is the mutation. As a consequence of the mutation, there are thousands of small effects as a consequence. They are all cellular random effects like changing gene expressions, changing cell fates, changing cell communications, etc., etc. We can summarize all these small effects under a normal distribution. Why is this possible? The central limit, limit theorem allows us to build means of these effects. The means are normally distributed. That's what the central limit theorem in statistics says. So we have a Gauss distribution on the slide. The stunning thing now is that we can combine and interact the continuous Gauss distribution with the discontinued distribution of the toes and the phenotype on the upper side. The steps of the phenotype distribution where the number of toes, for example, jumps from 20 to 22 or 22 to 24 marks a threshold in the Gauss distribution. In other words, only a small change of the cell effects underlaying the Gauss distribution leads to more toes. You won't believe that. Thresholds effects are common effects in biology. You might have heard of uh, turtle eggs, where the sex of the babies in the egg, which is again is a complex phenotypic trait, depends on the temperature of the sand. Only an inconsiderable small change in the temperature can change the sex of the turtle baby. Let's summarize so far what the consequences are for the evolutionary theory. First, yes, we do have a random mutation. But the story is not the mutation itself. The story is what happens in development. And the story then is a a huge variability of the trade between 18 and 26 toes, and B, the thresholds. Second, genetic determinism. There is no determinism if we look at this huge variability of toes. Third, gradualism in evolution. We don't have gradualism here. We have a complex, spontaneous change of one or more toes natural selection. We haven't seen what happens in evolution with the new toes and the new cat babies. They are just born. But we can state, A, it doesn't need thousand or a hundred thousand years and selective rounds to generate this variation. Instead it comes up in 24, 48 hours. B, selection gets a whole bunch 
of variation presented at once. 18, 20, 24, 6 toes at once. Please choose. Selection can choose out of this plasticity. Instead, that, instead of all these four attributes of the classic evolutionary theory, we now get a complex, spontaneous, polyphonistic, biased, fully integrated plastic variation. Full stop. Evolutionary theory begins to explain how organismal structure of variation arises. In our example, it arises internally. That means within the body, within the embryo, not externally as an endless interplay of random change and natural selection and random change and natural selection and 10,000 10, times. The new knowledge leads to a theory of phenotypic variation and innovation, the Evo Devo theory. This is another complex variation in animal world. The key is nat natural selection loses its function of biased governance. Sometimes development can deliver something like a turnkey solution. A new digit is what I mean by a turnkey solution. The weighting of evolutionary factors change in the eyes of Ivo Divo. Mutation loses its influence. Natural selection loses its influence. I'm not saying mutation is not needed anymore. And I'm not saying select, natural selection is not needed anymore, far away. Instead, I'm saying developmental mechanisms get more weight and more influence in the generation of phenotypic variation. The subject I was talking about today was published last December in the journal Evolutionary Biology by Springer, New York. The title of the paper is Biased Polyphonism in Polydactylous Cats Carrying a Single Point Mutation, the Hemingway Model for Digit Novelty. To whom who wants to, more, more, to know more about the extended evolutionary theory, I recommend my book, Darwin's Inheritage Rebuilt. With Darwin's Inheritage, I don't mean Darwin himself, I mean the evolutionary synthesis. Darwin knew more than we all know and, and that we all believe, but the evolutionary th synthesis was struck together. The book is in German language. Thank you for your attention.